Hi everyone. So today I'm following on from Ferdinand Christian Bauer and I'm sorry that this is another long one but I just kept finding more and more information on these people and before I know it I'm trying to keep it at one hour now it's two. So Ferdinand Christian Bauer he was a follower of Schleimacher before he was of Hegel. He was born in Breslau as the son of a clergyman and the Reformed Church. So all of these sons of clergymen that, you know, are all into humanism, while well, he also pursued broader humanistic interests, you know, and they're all about changing the Christian doctrine. He studied Kant, who is known for his attempt to reconcile the criticism of the Enlightenment with traditional Protestant Christianity. He also became influential in the evolution of higher criticism and his work forms part of the foundation of the modern field of hermeneutics, the theory of and mythology of interpretation, especially the interpretation of Bible texts. This is because of his profound effect of subsequent Christian thought, he is often called the father of modern liberal theology. And that can't be a good thing. And is considered an early leader in liberal Christianity. The neo-orthodox movement of the 20th century, typically, though not without challenge, seemed to be spearheaded by Karl Barth, was in many ways an attempt to challenge his influence. As a philosopher, he was a leader of German Romanticism. He was born in Breslau in the Prussian Silesia as a grandson of Daniel Schleimacher, a pastor at one time associated with the Zionites. The so Zionites sprang from a Philadelphian society founded in Oberfield. He was the foreman of a factory owned by his wife, a rich widow. He had read writings of an ancient modern visionaries and then formed an apocalyptic millenarian system of his own. Schleimacher's grandfather of the celebrated theologian Frederick Schleimacher was also influenced by Allah. The prophetess of the society was Anna van Buschel, a baker's daughter. Buschel had dreams and visions and saw apparitions. The newlyweds were known as the mother and father of Zion. It says here the theology became centralized around Allah and the Christian morality, which Zionites were founded upon, was replaced by the craving for coarse and sensual pleasure. So this kind of sounds like a, a cult that is like a Christian version of the Sabbatean Frankists. Schleimacher's contribution to the picture of Jews and Judaism cannot be overestimated. Although several leading theologians had already stressed that they regarded it as a problematic relationship between Judaism and the Old Testament on the one hand and Christianity on the other, it was Schleimacher's dominant role that brought such ideas to prominence in German Protestantism. Besides his doctrinal and hermeneutical teachings, Schleimacher taught on the New Testament ethics and church history. After his death, his works on philosophy and hermeneutics became highly influential, as did his views on Judaism. His writings also included a widespread New Testament introduction. Schlimack is likely to have to become acquainted with Herder's theology during his studies, and he encountered Schlimmer's theology in Halle, although he was sometimes being described as an autodidactic New Testament teller. Schlimacher was probably dependent on similar as well as J.D. McCallus for his overall perspective regarding New Testament exegesis and theology. So it says that pietism of Zinzendorf included a philo-Semitic stance, expecting the fulfillment of Paul's words that the whole of Israel shall be saved, Romans 11.26. However, Schleimacher would break with this just as he definitely broke with Hernart Pass in Halley. Having read Semler on Judaism, the study of Schleimacher often gives a sense of deja vu even as Schleimacher develops his own theology. The overall approach is familiar, including freedom from the dogmatic system of the church, the critical approach to classic theology and the canon, the focus on private religion and the tension between universalism and particularism. So the term philosemitism is a notable interest in respect for the appreciation of the Jewish people, their history, and the influence of Judaism. Now, we know that Judaism is basically the Talmud and Kabbalah. It's not associated with the Southern Kingdom, particularly on the part of a non-Jew. It says, etymology, the controversial term philosemite arose as a pejorative in Germany 
to describe the positive prejudice towards Jews. In other words, a philo-Semite is a Jew lover or Jew friend. It says the concept of philo-Semitism is not new and it was arguably avowed by such thinkers as the 19th century philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche, who described himself as an anti-Semite. Anti the rise of philo-Semitism has also prompted some to reconsider Jewish history and they argue that while anti-Semitism must be acknowledged, it is wrong to reduce the history of Jewish people to one merely of suffering, as has been fostered by well-meaning Gentile philo-Semites. Schleimacher was the philosopher that Ferdinand Christian Bauer first based his philosophies on. He then later changed to Hegel. Although a genetic connection between Schleimacher and Semmler's thinking has been disputed more so in the past than today, it seems clear that Schleimacher takes up and furthers insights from the same research tradition and religio-philosophical tradition. This also concerns the place of Jews and Judaism in the thinking. Like Semmler, it is important for Schleimacher to draw a line between Christianity on the one hand and Judaism and paganism on the other. And in the work of both authors, Judaism is marked by its narrow particularism. Nevertheless, Schleimacher sketched a universal perspective of religion that had quite a different scope to those of earlier theologians. Schleimacher's work, Speeches on Religion, came at a time that is said to have revolutionized religion. His studies coincided with the French Revolution, to which he was sympathetic, and with Napoleonic aggression in Prussia against Schleimacher was an ardent preacher. During the period of 1794 to 1796, Schleimacher served as a pastor in Landsberg. In 1796, he moved to Berlin, where he became chaplain to a hospital. In Berlin, he met Frederick and August Wilhelm Schlegel and other romantics became deeply engaged in the Romantic movement and collaborated with Schlegel's brothers on the short-lived but important literary journal, Athenaeum. Among Schleimacher's contributions to this journal was a short proto-feminist piece, Idea for a Catechism of Reason for Noble Ladies. During 1797 to 1799, he shared a house with Frederick Schlegel. Encouraged by the Romantic Circle to write a statement of his religious views in 1799, he published his most important and radical work in the philosophy of religion, on religion, speeches to its cultured despisers. This work sought to save religion in the eyes of, of its cultured despisers, prominent among some of the Romantics, by inter ally arguing that human immortality and even God are inessential to religion, diagnosing current religions more off-putting features in terms of its corruption by worldly bourgeois culture and state interference, and arguing that there are an endless multiplicity of valid forms of religion. The book won Schleiermacher a national reputation. In the same year, 1799, he also published an essay on the situation of the Jews in Prussia. Letters on the occasion of the political theological task and the open letter of Jewish householders. In this work, he rejected a proposed expedient of effecting the Jews' civil assimilation through baptism, which would, he argued, harm both Judaism and Christianity. He instead advocated full civil rights for them on certain reasonable conditions. Same year, also Schleimacher's composition of the interesting short essay towards a theory of sociable conduct, which is important as his first significant discussion of the art of conversation, an art which would later be central to his dialectic lectures. So here we have a bit of a connection with this um, Rothschild Jewish Mendelssohn family. Dorothea Mendelssohn Schlegel, the eldest daughter of Moses Mendelssohn, was an author and editor whose work received little recognition during her lifetime. She married Simon Veit, became an active in Berlin's dynamic salon culture in 1794. She began calling herself Dorothea rather than her given name, Brenda. In 1799, she fell in love with the controversial writer Frederick Schlegel and divorced Veit that same year. Her relationship with Frederick alienated Dorothea from her family. The couple left Berlin and travelled to Jena, Paris and Cologne before settling in Vienna.
where they married and converted to Catholicism. Why did they convert to Catholicism? Because we're going to look at this Schlegel later and I'll show you. He's an atheist. The two decades spent in Vienna were Dorothea's happiest under Frederick's name. Dorothea published her only novel, Florentine, in 1799 and her edited volume of medieval French texts. So I'm just going to go to Fab Pedigree to get a bit of an idea on who this Dorothea actually is. And here's her father here, Moses Mendelssohn, and his son, Abraham Mendelssohn Bartholdy. Now, if we look into their family name, he married Fromé. Fromé is her first name. Fromé Guggenheim. So the Guggenheim Museum is named after this family. And on this side, we've got the Oppenheimers, as in the De Beers Diamonds and the famous Oppenheimer of the atomic bomb program, Frankenfurter, the alien perverts. <laughs> I've made that joke before. And over on his father's side, again, Mendelssohn, we've got the Bonhams. The Bonhams are related to the Rothschilds and Helena Bonham Carter. The actress comes from this line. Salomon is his wife, but his sister is Dorothea. And, you know, the mother's from a rabbinical line, Levi Shapiro. I wonder if they're related to the alt news. What's his name? So it looks like she isn't mentioned as a child in this particular genealogy, but let's have a look at her wiki profile. And she was born Brenda Mendelssohn in 1764 in Berlin, oldest daughter of philosopher Moses Mendelssohn, a leading figure in German Enlightenment. In 1783, she married the merchant and banker Simon Veit, brother of physician David Veit. Their son, Philip Veit, would later become part of a circle of German Christian painters called the Nazarenes, who influenced the English painters in the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood. It says the epithet Nazarene was adopted by a group of early 19th century German Romantic painters who aimed to revive spirituality in art. The name Nazarene came from a term of derision used against them for their affection of biblical manner of clothing and hair. And here's Moses Mendelssohn here, a German Jewish philosopher and theologian. <laughs> they always make up these people are poor. They come from a poor Jewish ghetto somewhere, you know. I mean, look at this. Mendelssohn Barthold, he married his cousin Elizabeth Oppenheim, granddaughter of his great uncle Joseph Mendelssohn. You know, these Oppenheims weren't poor. So let's just follow their family line a little bit down the road. Doesn't look like they're actually putting all of the, the family members on this website. Here we cannot click on these two children of Abraham Mendelssohn Bartholdy, but Rebecca Mendelssohn Bartholdy. So just on a tangent here, I am looking for Schlegel in Fab Pedigree and I come up with Johann Schlegel von Nippenberg and up here it says that he's Lady Diana's 15th grandfather. His daughter was Maria von Nippenberg. I don't know if it's just me but also in this name Schlegel, I can see Hegel. It, we've got H-E-G-E-L, just kind of a coincidence. So let's go back here. We've got Maria Louise von Degenfield and she's married Charles Louis von Bayern. It's kind of a bit like Bayer. So on the mother's side, Elizabeth Stuart, Princess of Great Britain. And she married this Charles Louis von Bayern. We've got some Danish royal families here. Often they had a lot of Jewish money who had changed their name to aristocracy. So it's quite possible that these people may have been merchant banking wealth. I don't know. I'm just uh, saying that it's possible. But the aristocracy, royal family, Habsburgs down here. So it's kind of interesting that this Schlegel family name ties in with all these, uh, this aristocracy and this name Bayer, Bayern. 
We've got this person showing up with the Schlegel name again, uh, Frederick von Beisenbrau. Child Dorothea von Beisenbrau. And his wife is Hedwig von Schlegel within this same sort of family group. We've got all these, uh, His Royal Highness Charles XIV, great father. So all this aristocracy is linked to this family. So I was just messing around with the Schlegel name. Uh, apparently it can be pronounced Schlegel as well. And here I have Maria Schlegel von Gottleben, Faber. Her, she is the daughter of Zacchaeus Faber. Kind of makes me think of Faber Castell, the pencils. Wife of Paul Gottlieb Schlegel, Schlegel. Martin Schlegel, husband of Maria Schlegel von Gottlieb. Chris, father of Christoph Gottlieb Schlegel. And he's the father of Johann Elias Schlegel. And he is the father of Johann Frederick Schlegel. They like to call their sons Johann because we've got the father of Johann Liebrich Schlegel, Johann Elias Schlegel. Let's have a look at him. We've got another Johann Adolf Schlegel here. And here we, ha here we go. So we've got Johann Adolf Schlegel, who's the father of August Wilhelm von Schlegel and Frederick Schlegel and Johann Karl Fut Gott Schlegel, brother of Johann Liebrich Schlegel. So this is the same family. So there's kind of a little factoid here. This is Johann Elias Schlegel. This is uh, Frederick's uncle. And it says here that in 1743 he became a private secretary to his relative von Spenner, the Saxon ambassador at the Danish court. Now apparently these people are some kind of poverty-stricken family. When we go to Johann Adolf Schlegel, he was just a deacon. He was a deacon and teacher at Forta. And when we go to his son, Frederick, it makes him sound like some poverty-stricken kind of uh, peasant. Here, his father, Johann Adolf Schlegel, was the pastor at the Lutheran Market Church. So, you know, very uh, humble, it's average people, not. This is the father, Johann Adolf Schlegel, the Market Church Lutheran minister or deacon. So, you know, it's enough to mention that these people have some kind of Wikipedia page de devoted to several family members. But what I wanted to point out was here was that he worked for this family family member called Von Spenner. Now, do we just have to put a C in here? We've got Spencer, like Lady Diana Spencer. Remember when we found this person here, Johann Schlegel von Nippenberg, and up here it said Lady Diana, great 15, great grandfather. So I'm kind of thinking that this Schlegel here is the same Schlegel as this Schlegel family here. Another interesting person that comes up with the name Spenner is Philip Jacob Spenner and he was uh, a theologian, author and leading figure in German pietism, a movement among the 17th and 18th century Protestants that stressed personal improvement and upright conduct as the most important manifestations of Christian faith. During his studies at Strasbourg, Spenner developed an interest at reforming Lutheran Orthodox practice. In particular, he objected to the rigidity of ecclesiastical structures and the lack of moral discipline among the clergy. At the age of 31, Spenner became superintendent of the Lutheran Church at Frankfurt am Main, where he began his Collegia Pietatis, Schools of Piety. Devotional gatherings intended to encourage personal spiritual growth, prayer, and Bible study. Well, it doesn't sound that bad. So piety, influential religious reform movement that began among German Lutherans in the 17th century, it emphasized personal faith against the main Lutheran church's perceived stress on doctrine and theology over Christian living. Pietism quickly spread and later became concerned with social and educational matters. As a phenomenon of personal religious renewal, 
Its indirect influence has persisted in Germany and other parts of Europe into the 21st century. English Puritanism reached the European continent through the translation of works by Richard Baxter, John Bunyan and others. Religious ex exiles in the Netherlands, among them William Ames, developed Dutch Pietism. So, you know, when we start seeing these movements or events popping up in several different countries, we start thinking there's something planned behind this, or I do, because, you know, we've seen the Enlightenment periods popping up in all these different countries and having to work or have different effects due to the different cultural differences of these countries. Now we've got the Reformation and Pietism popping up or Puritism. And so this doesn't sound too good to me. It says, notable signs of renewal, including interest in devotional literature, so literature other than the Bible, and the mystical tradition also emerged out of the devastation wrought in Germany by the Thirty Years' War. So Philip Spenner was a German Lutheran theologian who essentially founded what would become known as Pietism. He later dubbed the father of Pietism a prolific writer in his two main works, were published while he was a chief pastor in the Lutheran Church of Frankfurt in 1691. He was invited to Berlin by the court of Brandenburg. Even the Berlin Spenner was at odds with the predominant Lutheran orthodoxy as he had been all his life. Spenner influenced the foundation of the University of Halle, but the theological faculty and other universities, that of Wittenberg, formally accused him of 264 errors says, after a brief time at grammar school in Colmar, he went to Strasbourg in 1651 where he devoted himself to the study of philology, history and philosophy and won a degree of master in 1653 by a disputation against the philosophy of Thomas Hobbes. He then became private tutor to the princes Christian and Charles of the Electorate of the Palatine and lectured in the University on Philology and History. From 1659 to 1662, he visited the University of Basel, Tübingen and Geneva and commenced the study of heraldry, which he pursued throughout his life. In Geneva, especially his religious views and tendencies were turned in the direction of mysticism. So here on the North American Lutheran Church website, it's got a little bit about Philip Jacob Spenner. And he doesn't seem to have some too bad things to say, but then he also has some bad connections here. It says he was profoundly influenced by Juarez Custentum, True Christianity, by the Lutheran Johann Arndt. Spenner studied history and philosophy at the University of Strasbourg from 1651 to 1653. On a visit to Switzerland, he came under the influence of Jean de Labadie, 1610-1674, a Jesuit who had converted to the Reformed Church and his piety took on personal and interior character. After serving as pastor in Strasbourg, Spenner and his parish in Frankfurt, ravaged by 30 years of war, introduced Collegia Pietatis, piety groups, from which came the name Pietism twice weekly devotional meetings in his house and published his Pia Desidera, Devote Desires, with six major proposals for reform and revitalization of the church. Now, kind of makes me suspect that he's come under this Jesuit here, Jean de Labadie, and this particular Jesuit, converted apparently i don't think they ever really convert do they and his piety took on a personal and interior character so this particular jesuit had massive influence on his piety and the whole starting of this pious movement in the lutheran church jean de labadie was a 17th century french pious originally a jesuit priest he became a member of the reformed church why is it that these Jesuits always look like pointy-faced warlocks? It says in 1650, before founding the community, which became known as the 
Labadeus in 1669. At its height, the movement numbered around 600 with thousands of ardent further afield. It attracted some notable female converts such as the famed poet and scholar Anna Maria van Sherman and the entomological artist Maria Marion. Labadee combined the influence of Jansenism, was an early modern theological movement with Catholicism, primarily active in the Kingdom of France, that arose in an attempt to reconcile the theological concepts of free will and divine grace. Jansenists claimed to profess the true doctrine of grace. And don't we hear that in all the Protestant churches? If you don't accept our doctrine, then you're not saved because we're the only church that has the true message. Reformed pietism, developing a form of radical Christianity with an emphasis upon holiness and Christian communal living. Labadee's teachings gained hold in the Netherlands. It says, the son of an officer, he entered the Jesuit order in 1625, was ordained in 1635, but he left in 1639 due to poor health and tensions with the other brothers. He turned to Jansenism and intensive study of the Bible and began to draw to Calvinism. I don't know, was he part of this counter-Jesuit reformation? I mean, did he change? Was he a changed man? Okay, so according to Wikipedia on the Labadeus, it says that with a broad-mindedness unusual for the period, Labadee was gracious and cautiously welcoming towards the move of repentance and new zeal among Jews in a messianic movement around Sabbatai Zevi in 1667. This is interesting. At length in 1669, at 59 years of age, Labadee broke away from all established denominations and began a Christian community at Amsterdam. In three adjoining houses lived a core of some 60 adherents to Labadee's teaching. Sounds a bit like a cult. They shared possessions after the pattern of the church as described in the New Testament book of Acts. Persecution forced them to leave after a year and they moved to Hereford in Germany. Here the community became more firmly established until war forced them to move to Altona, then in Denmark now a suburb of Hamburg, where Labadee died. So I just found this little piece in an article, which I'm going to read the full article later on. But for now, I'll just add this little piece in here. It's talking about Zindendorf. And it says that Zindendorf was raised by a grandmother who corresponds with Leibniz in Latin, read the Bible in Hebrew and Greek and studied Syrian and Chaldean and exposed him to themes of Jacob. Boehm and Christian Kabbalism. This would bring Zinzendorf into contact with heterodox Jews whose sympathies for the teachings of Sabbatai Zevi led them to positions close to Christian students of the Kabbalah, seen by many pious as a medium between the two religions. So the pious, this is the mysticism, saw the Kabbalah as a medium between the two religions. Zinzendorf was the pupil and godson of the direct originator of pietism, Philip Jacob Spenner, 1635-1705. Pietism was a movement within Lutheranism that began in the late 17th century whose forerunners were Jacob Boehm and Johann Valentin Andrea, the author of the Rosicrucian Manifestos. Spenner was powerfully influenced by the preaching of the converted Jesuit preacher Jean de Labadie in 1610 to 1674. Originally a Jesuit priest, Labadie became a member of the Reformed Church in 1650 before founding the community which became known as the 1669. Labadie was among those who had been kept informed on the progress of Sabbatai Zevi's mission by Peter Sererius and spoke about Sabbateans in his sermons. So there we go. This guy isn't a good guy and it looks like he's linked to this Schlegel and this is important and I'll show you why coming up. Okay, so Nicholas Zinzendorf was a German religious social reformer, bishop of the Moravian Church. The Moravian Church or the Moravian Brethren, formerly the Unitus Fratrum, is one of the oldest Protestant denominations in Christianity dating back to the Bohemian Reformation in the 15th century and the unity of the Brethren founded in 
the kingdom of Bohemia. Now we'll have to look into this another time, but this image here of the lamb with the uh, St. George cross is a pretty uh, interesting image. As I said earlier, it's the Anus Dea, and there's a particular uh, version of this where the lamb is standing on a book, which one would assume is the Bible. It's very similar to the lion from the city of Venice. And this lion is said to be the lion of St. Mark, but it also looks a lot like the Persian or Zoroastrian lion and uh, the winged sun disc of the religion of Zoroaster. Founder of the Hearn Hunter Bruder Gemeen, I, I'm sorry about my pronunciation, Christian mission, pioneer and major figure of 18th century Protestantism. He played a role in starting the Protestant mission movement by supporting two determined Moravian missionaries, John Leonard Dober and David Nishmet, to go to the Danish colony of St. Thomas via Copenhagen to minister to the enslaved population, see Moravian slaves. So Moravian slaves, African slaves. Zinzendorf was critical of slavery and supported the first Moravian missionaries who, in spite of Danish royal support from Charlotte Amelie of Denmark, faced discouragement from some Moravians at Hernhut, including Christian David. The Danish West India Company, well, this is where the British East India Company started because they came from the Netherlands and moved to England when the Jews were allowed back in there. So the Danish West India Company and the Dutch East India Company, it's all the same base. And here it says, the first known settlement on Danish territory was based on a royal dispensation. Industrious Christian IV founded Glockstad on the river Elbe in today's German state of Schleswig, Holston in 1616. When it initially threatened to founder, he decided in 1619 to allow Jewish merchant Albert Dionis to settle in the town. He thus hoped to ensure its success. This dispensation was extended to a few other Jews, and in 1628 their status was formalized by being promised protection, the right to hold private religious services, and maintain their own cemetery. Albert Dionis gained special status within the Danish royal court, apparently as a source of credit for ambitious projects. Gabriel Gomez, who also attained status, persuaded Frederick III to allow Sephardi Jews to reside in Denmark while conducting trade. At that time, Ashkenazi Jews, in contrast to the Spartan, were forbidden to enter unless they were specifically granted letters of safe passage and were subject to considerable fines. If caught without the required documents, nevertheless, many of the Jews who settled in the kingdom in the coming years were Ashkenazi. Now, just going off on another tangent here, this right to hold private religious services, and I think this really ties in with the Puritan settlement of the Americas and separation of church and state. Now, I've always held that to be a really good thing, but you know in hindsight now and i'm looking into some of this stuff with these puritans and i'm kind of thinking that it might have been part of this jewish emancipation to allow or a separation of church and state so they could control state politically through freemasonry and they could control church through corrupted church but they had the right to practice their private religion uh without challenge and you know, God hates when we mix religions and the right to religious freedoms, though protecting us for our religious freedoms and, you know, this is kind of like the uh, Achilles heel that these particular Jews have wanted their own emancipation and religious freedom. In doing so, they have had to allow us religious freedoms as well. But unfortunately, we've allowed them the freedom to practice this pagan abomination, basically. In truth, there's never really a separation between 
politics and religion. And Jesus himself shows this because he is both high king and priest in one. Politics and religion go hand in glove. You know, we need the spiritual and the righteousness of the the law to set the standards of the country by. When we gave up on Christian principles, the Western world went down the toilet. And as it says in the Bible, Jesus will rule with a rod of iron. It doesn't mean he's cruel or that, you know, his kingdom will be tyrannical. It just means that there's no deviation of the rules of God or the the standards of the kingdom. We can't have this mixed society or culture in God's kingdom. It's just that mankind can't seem to get this right as we inherit sin. So on uh, the Wikipedia page of Johann Leonard Doba, it says down here, the story of the Moravian slaves, a popular misconception is that Doba and Nietzschemen sold themselves into slavery in order to gain access to African slaves at St. Thomas. In fact, although they expressed willingness to do this, white slavery was not allowed in any of the West Indian islands. So they plied their individual trades to support themselves. However, there is a story preserved by Bonnie Batonin, her book The Bow in the Cloud or The Negro's Memorial about Leonard Doba where she says, about this time, meeting with some pious companions of Count Zinzendorf, who had arrived at the court of Denmark to attend the coronation of Christian VI, Anthony broke his mind to them, saying that someone would go and preach the gospel to my sister in St. Thomas. In the course of a few weeks, the Negro, Anthony himself, arrived at Hermhut and confirmed at a public meeting there all that he had stated at Copenhagen, respecting the wants and the willingness of his ignorant and oppressed countrymen in St. Thomas to receive the gospel. But he added, so long and so severely were they worked by their masters that unless those who went to preach to them would consent to become slaves themselves and labour with the Negroes in the plantation, they would have little opportunity of communicating divine instruction to them. This intelligence did not in the smallest degree daunt the devout young men they were both ready not only to be bound but to die for the lord jesus such indeed was the simplicity of purposing singleness of heart and strength of faith by which they were actuated they were willing to make any sacrifice which might be required now this proves to me that count zinzendorf was at the danish royal court and at the same time, around this time, so was von Spener, who was the Saxon ambassador at the Danish court and who was related to Schlegel. So I think that this shows that Schlegel was related to Philip Spener as well. It's the same Spener or the same family connection. So this Zinzendorf was the beginning of missionaries to these African and pagan nations trying to convert them to Christianity. Now, when you see later, uh, I'll go further into the character of Zinzendorf, you've got to question his motives in doing this because on one hand, he's trying to save the pagan slaves and rescue them on the other hand he's trying to corrupt christianity and european culture in reality a lot of this christian preaching to these pagan people and other nations is what has brought about the migration into europe and western nations it also allowed for better access for these East India companies from wherever they were from to get into these countries and to exploit minerals and resources. And we know who was running these companies. It was these Jews and aristocracy. But unfortunately for us Western people, we have taken the blame for stealing wealth from 
these African and Asian and basically Indigenous nations. His dress was simple. His personal appearance gave an impression of distinction and force. His projects were often misunderstood. In 1736, he was banished from Saxony, but in 1749, the government rescinded its decree and begged him to establish within its jurisdiction more settlements like at Hernhut. Notable for providing shelter for German-speaking Moravian exiles at Hernhut, this settlement was influenced by the pious ideas from the Lutheran faith he was brought up in. Okay, so he's brought up in this pious movement now. Nowadays, the Moravian church remains heavily shaped by Zinzendorf in addition to its Hussite origin. He was called Ludwig or Brother Ludwig by his inmates. He is commemorated as a hymn writer and renewer of the church by the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America on its calendar of saints on the 10th of May. Born into one of the most prominent noble families of the region, House of Zinzendorf, Nicholas was the only son of Count George Ludwig von Zinzendorf by his second wife, Baroness Charlotte Justinia von Gersdorf. So I'm just kind of wondering if this relative of Schlegel, von Spenner, who the Saxon ambassador at the Danish court. So they're a Saxon, they're an ambassador at the Danish court, and we've got Nicholas Zinzendorf, who's working with the Danish government here and slavery, and his godfather is this guy, Philip Spenner. And I'm kind of wondering if this Spenner is related to the Spenner, who's a relative of the Schlegel family because these people are all tied in together so i'll just go into the legacy of pietism here it says the final impact of pietism is so far reaching in history that it is impossible to analyze fully here the mere existence of the wesleyan brethren and moravian church indicate terrific impact then there was the effect on lutheran church this has been discussed in works by Stoffler, Harnack, and Ruschel, to name a few. Pietism is usually admitted to have influenced numerous other churches, including Mennonites and Puritans, the Quakers, and Dutch Reform in early America. We know that New England Puritan Cotton Martha corresponded with Frankie, for instance. In society outside of the church, pietism is credited with contributing to the impetus for a spirit, tolerance, and religious freedom. Johann Wolfgang Goethe, Goethe and Immanuel Kant are examples of important secular thinkers who were heavily exposed to pietism in their youth. Noll, even wrongly, I think, goes as far as seeing pietistic influence in Jansenism and the visions of the Jewish mystic Baal Shem Tov. Some of the evaluations of pietism impact are quite negative. It's hard to deny that hyper individualism is a danger inherent in the movement. Today, much of American fundamentalism draws its primarily inward devotional ethic from pietistic sources. In a different vein, Noel, speaking from an apparently sentimental rather than a biblical perspective, worries that pietism can underrate the value of Christian traditions. Others would say that this is the main value of the movement. Is this another side of the Hegelian argument? If pietism works well in developing this leftist, liberal self-righteousness, I, I guess you would say, then perhaps it is. Regarding ecclesiology, the great themes that Spenner brought to light in the area of lay ministry are arguably the most revolutionary and positive truths uncovered by the Re Reformation. The outburst of excitement for Christianity that resulted, even though temporary in many cases, was enough to impact most of the world before it had spent its force. And on my travels looking for various different Schlegels, I came across this book, The Rosicrucian and Magister Christopher Schlegel, Hermetic Roots of America. It says, by Manly P. Hall, of all people, sections include German Foundation, the Rosicrucian Manifestos, Rosicrucian Landmarks in the 17th through 19th centuries, Esoteric Foundations and 
in England, etc., etc. So this ties this uh, Lutheran Reformation to the Rosicrucians once again. So people are saying that the the arms of Martin Luther are Rosicrucian. We've got all these uh, Lutheran ministers n named Schlegel, and they're tied to, according to Manly P. Hall, the Rosicrucian hermetic roots in America. So these Puritan Protestant people that were founding the New World and, you know, overtaking Western society were not as positive as we've been told in church. And I'll read this page here that is provided from this book on Google. It says, among the curiosities in the library of the Philosophical Research Society is a little book which is a translation into Dutch of the Republica Cristiano Politicane by Johan Valentin André. And I think I've mentioned him in relation to Ferdinand Christian Bauer with an esoteric interpretation by Jan van Richtenborough. The title page and the author name were removed for the purpose of protection. During the German occupation of the Netherlands in World War II, it was dangerous to be in possession of these books. This copy was among those hidden in the strong room of the Court of International Justice in the Peace Palace. I wonder why perhaps the Germans got rid of these books. Maybe they needed to hide this information. The only place where the Gestapo had no entrance. Anyone found with a copy of this book would be summarily shot. It would seem that the indignities which Andre suffered during his lifetime upon his name and writings were to be revived nearly 300 years after his death. There was no lack of proof that Johann Valentin Andre was closely associated with the Dukes of Brunswick Lundberg. Seleniana or Gustalia is a collection of letters mostly written by Andre to the Dukes of the House of Brunswick Lundberg and dedicated to Duke Augustus. The little volume has an engraved title page, a portrait of Andre, and he's further illustrated with likeness of four illustrious members of his ducal family. On page 28 is a woodcut figure of a crowned Roman soldier with six arms and legs and three faces. The foot gear is especially interesting and includes a cavalier's boot, Roman sandal leg iron with chains, an actor's buskin and a gentleman's foot gear decorated with a symbolic rose. The arms carry various objects and the figure stands on a base decorated with numerous symbols in the background at viewers left in a church with a tall steeple. It is difficult to understand why this figure should be included in a collection of letters published in 1649. Now in this picture it says engraved portrait of Johann Valentin Andre. Obviously Andre was a Rosicrucian also and his profile on Wikipedia says that he was a German theologian who claimed to be the author of an ancient text known as Chimesk Hoc Zit Christiani Rosicruz Anno 1459, published in 1616 Strasbourg in English, Chimical Wedding of Christian Rosicruz in 1459. This became one of the three founding works of Rosicrucianism which was both a legend and a fashionable cultural phenomenon across Europe in this period. Andre was a prominent member of the Protestant Utopian movement, which began in Germany and spread across Northern Europe and into Britain under the mentorship of Samuel Hartlieb and John Amos Comenius. The focus of the movement was the need for education and encouragement of sciences as the key to national prosperity. Well, it certainly hasn't given us any prosperity and in hindsight. But like many vaguely religious Renaissance movements at this time, the scientific idea being promoted were often tinged with hermeticism, occultism and neoplatonic concepts. The threats of heresy, charges posed by rigid religious authorities, Protestant and Catholic, and a scholastic intellectual climate often forced these activists to hide behind 
fictional secret societies and write anonymously in support of their ideas while claiming access to secret ancient wisdom. So it says that his mother, Maria Moza, so probably from the rabbinic group, went to Tübingen as a widow and was caught apothecary in 1607 to 1617. So she's obviously pretty connected. It also says that after he taught young nobles and hiked with his students through Switzerland, France, Austria and Italy, he visited Dillingen, a bastion of the Jesuits, whom he regarded as the Antichrist. In 1608, he returned to Dübingen. He came to know Tobias Hess, a Paraclesian physician with the interest in apocalyptic prophecy from 1610 to 1612. So this book that he had, The Chimical Wedding of Christian Rosencruz, is a German book edited in 1616 in Strasbourg. Its anonymous authorship is attributed to Johann Valentin André, although it is markedly different from the Fema Fraternitas and Confessio Fraternitas in style and in subject matter. It is an allegoric romance story divided into seven days or seven journeys like Genesis and recounts how Christian Rosencruz was invited to go to a wonderful castle full of miracles in order to assist the chimical wedding of the king and the queen, that is the husband and the bride. So it first appeared in Strasbourg in 1616. It was written in German. It says no author was named in the book other than Christian Rosencruz, but Johann Valentinus André, born in 1586 to 1654, claimed to be the author in his autobiography. The first English version appeared in 1690 by Ezekiel Foxcroft, followed by translations into many languages throughout time. It says although the book first appears in 1616, the story takes place over 150 years earlier. The events of the story span seven days and are divided into seven chapters. So it's kind of interesting that Martin Luther has this Rosicrucian style family crest or arms and he is at least a hundred years earlier than Andreas. Martin Luther was born in 1483 and he died in 1546. So was this particular family crest or Lutheran crest, I should say, not family crest, that was Rosicrucian added later in the Lutheran church to Martin Luther and not necessarily something that he used himself. Now his words on Mary are pretty non-biblical, but, you know, he was a Catholic. You'd think he would have uh, rectified that doctrine. So I don't know if he was Rosicrucian, but most certainly, the Lutheran church was very early on corrupted. So Johann Valentin Andreas was noted as one of the Tübingen University alumni. And according to information on this book he wrote, it says Christian Rosencruz, the character in the book, was a scholar or doctor who discovered and learned esoteric wisdom on a pilgrimage to the Middle East among Turkish, Arab and Persian sages. So this Chaldean priesthood supposedly in the early 15th century when he returned home he founded the fraternity of the rose cross with himself freighter crc as head of the order under his direction a temple called sanctus spiritus or the house of the holy spirit was built it is described that his dead body was discovered by a fellow brother in a perfect state of preservation 120 years after his death as Rosencruz had predicted, in a heptagonal chamber erected by himself as a stone house of knowledge. Some occultists, in including, have stated that Rosencruz later reappeared as the Count of Saint Germain. Oh my goodness. So the Count of Saint Germain. Wow, this ties in with the, uh, the Gabriel cult online. A courtier, adventurer and alchemist who reportedly died on February 27, 1748, others believe Rosencruz to be a pseudonym for a more famous historical figure, usually Francis Bacon. They also say that Francis Bacon was the son of Queen Elizabeth I and potentially was the one who wrote the Shakespeare works. So this Count of St. Germain is said to be some kind of messiah character or the Metatron. 
I think that this RC Christian as well was tied in with the Georgia Guidestones, which is really interesting because this St. George Cross ties in with the country of Georgia. And then we've got the Schlegel family that are using this lamb with a St. George Cross on a flag. So that lamb with the St. George Cross is the Anu Dea, is a Latin name under which the Lamb of God is honoured with Christian liturgies descending from the historic Latin liturgical tradition, including those of Roman Catholicism, Lutherism and Anglicism. So it's all under this uh, obviously Roman Catholic banner. It is the name given to a specific prayer that occurs in these liturgies and is the name given to the music pieces that accompany the text of this prayer. Now, remember through the liturgy, because people weren't allowed to read the Bible, and understand what was uh, being said by the apostles. They had to learn from a priest. And the way they would learn was through the liturgy, through the words of the music that they had to sing, and through the images that were presented on the church walls. Okay, so why do these people keep popping up in my work? I knew nothing of these people until I saw a video of theirs pop up about the Radhanite merchant group. And I thought, great. Somebody else is talking about this. And I watched a few of their videos and was pretty horrified at the words that were coming out of their mouth. And now again, here they are popping up in something that I'm researching. It says, The Parable of Saint Germain. And this is from the AIM website. Douglas and Tyler Gabriel follow the teaching of Rudolf Steiner. So we know Rudolf Steiner was a student of theosophy. Helena Blavatsky, and St. Germain. The intuitive approach allows for many invaluable insights. I will extract several relevant comments from the allegory and translate them into my own Christian framework. I don't think it's Christian, buddy. All right, you better not use that term. At the heart of the internet is a cold, dark dissonance that is anti-life orientated and is stealing the warmth, light and harmony of life. Is this the nice little flame from the Zoroastrian God? Lucifer and Ahriman also work together and try to eliminate the truly human qualities that should reign over the middle realm of the heart. Yes, he will, and in the end, it will be the author of his death. Humans and machines should not cross over their independent territories. We have enough problems with mad scientists blending DNA from plant to animals and from animals to human. When woven together with other materials that have seemingly been given life, scientists have created a new kingdom of nature. Thou sawest the iron mixed with the miry clay, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as the iron is not mixed with the clay. This is the key verse in Daniel that refers to several world control groups. One is that of technology joined with Boda Vista. Another thing that we shouldn't mix is religion, and that's in Deuteronomy, that if anyone mixes religions with God, he will be cursed from three to four generations. So mixing these religions here is something that God hates. They have had a multi-generational alliance that is beginning to break down. One is the effect to inject nanobots of DNA quantum computers with antenna that will receive external inputs as a case in point. Using Douglas Gabriel's astrophysics model, our DNA fractal particles, the cosmic fractal of the planets in tow with the sun, in times of stress, this cosmic energy is available with the Christian framework. When sin abounds, grace will abound that much more. So I take it that this particular group do like to mix their religions. And just as the early Protestant fakery, they were mixing a truth with a lie. Perhaps the most dangerous analogy suggested by Gabriel is the Araman Lucifer archetype. Because for most Christians that I know personally, this is their biggest fear that same fear prevents them from understanding that Lucifer does not exist for the believer. See Revelation 17, 8. There is clear difference between group minds, whether organic or exemplified by the Tibetan monks or technological as exemplified by Illuminati, DARPA and company. 
these psychic group minds are not supernatural they are illusion once the veil is pierced then real spiritual growth can begin the cold dark dissonance at the heart of the internet is the desire for the imprisoned worm or sarks or satan to escape this planet it hopes to do this by encapsulating corrupt dna into some form that will allow it to escape the 90,000 degree barrier that surrounds the sun and its planets in tow. I wonder if uh, this has anything to do with the whole philosophy of, of Scientology as well. What was his name, the Scientologist? So here it says, uh, close to a century before the secret doctrine, Carl von Eckert Schorzen wrote about enlightened mystics guiding the development of hu the human race in his late 18th century book, The Cloud Upon the Sanctuary, which provided the blueprint for much of Blavatsky's work. Eckhart Schordson, writing about secret knowledge, influenced not only theosophy, but also the occult ideas of English magician Aleister Crowley. Theosophy became a key influence on various New Age religious ideas emerging through the 20th century, as well as a number of fiction writers such as H.P. Lovecraft and Robert E. Howard. In this article in 1946, Aleister Crowley, the sorcerer and mystic whose dabblings in black magic earned him the title the wickedest man in the world, found a new disciple and welcomed him to one of his occult communities in California. The extraordinary activities of this new and enthusiastic disciple are described in a vast collection of papers owned by the former admirer of Crowley, which we have examined. The man in question is Lafayette Ron Hubbard, right? Head of the now notorious Church of Scientology. Al Ron Hubbard. I mean, he taught about aliens in space and beings trapped in the sun and that, didn't he as well? Can't be done. It is a false hope by the father of lies caught within his own web. Now they're saying that Satan is trapped by the sun. Now, that had nothing to do with Saint Germain. So just a little more background on Saint Germain and who he was because these people have stated that they follow Saint Germain and Rudolf Steiner. It says across the ages, a rarefied collection of people loom larger than the time in which they existed. Their influence spans generations. Their impact resonates long past their physical lifetime. Count Saint Germain, also known as Comte de Saint Germain or Saint Germain, was an enigmatic figure of the 1700s who archived notoriety in European high society, attracting kings, playwrights and followers. He was considered a mystic philosopher, social influencer and an ascended master. To some, the Count represented the second coming of Jesus Christ. Messianic figure, kind of a bit like Sabadai Zevi. And a being who defied death being reincarnated throughout the ages. Who was Count Saint Germain? And how did he achieve a godlike status that remains today? Count Saint Germain's beginnings are enigmatic as the life he lived believed to have been born in 1710. Many claims he was of Portuguese descent, perhaps from a Jewish family. Of course he was. <laughs> perhaps, there's no doubt about it. Others tracked his birthplace to the Italian village of San Germano, which explains the name he was most commonly known as Count Saint Germain. It sounds a bit familiar to also Saint Ignatius Loyola, who I believe he was from Spain, though, and he was said to be from the Basque people in Spain. He was also known by other pseudonyms, including the Marquis de Montferrat, Comte Bellamare, Count Chevalier Schuning, Count Weldon, Comte Soltikov, Graf Zorogi, and Prince. Rakoxi, son of Francis II, Rakoxi of Transylvania. There's some uh, hard names to pronounce. What is known is that Saint Germain possessed great personal wealth and a wide reaching knowledge, which included mastery of most European languages, the arts, music, composition, and virtuosity as a violinist. He sounds like a bit of a con man, too. It has been said of his musical ability, he played as if he was an entire orchestra. Well-traveled among the aristocracy, Saint Germain 
with his quick wit and intelligence, wielded great influence politically, which also caused him to be seen as a provocateur. After being arrested and later released in England in 1743 as a Jacobite spy, so probably a Jesuit, Count St. Germain fled England and moved to France, establishing himself as a central figure in Louis XV's court, where he was appointed a, a, a diplomat. However, after a political dispute involving relations between Austria and France, Comte de Saint Germain fled to Russia, where it is said he played an important, albeit behind the scene, role in the 1762 Russian Revolution. But aside from Saint Germain's political impact across Europe, his stature in the mystical and spiritual world is where his lasting influence was felt mo most felt. I'm beginning to wonder whether this Saint Germain who seems to exist throughout all these time periods is actually some kind of pseudonym for this specific group that have been involved in changing all of these events. So they may use this persona of Saint Germain to identify as a man, but really they're a group that are popping up in these different time periods and interfering with uh, historical events. Kind of like a Rosicrucian 007. I mean, just like the RC Christian whose name was written on the Georgia Guidestones, people put two and two together and believed that they were erected by the Rosicrucians. And it's likely that these particular Rosicrucians were involved in these historical time periods with these for example, the King of France or the Jacobite Revolution and even in the early Americas. Known for his involvement in the occult, which was popular interest in the 18th century France, Saint Germain was also believed to be an alchemical master, so much so he was known as the Violet Flame, referring to the highest frequency of spiritual energy and I've just added a picture of the purple heart here and it's got a profile of George Washington on it. I'm just wondering if it's really supposed to be Saint Germain or maybe George Washington was an avatar of Saint Germain. And remember how AIM stated about the flaming heart, the burning heart, and the flame is purple, so we have the purple heart. According to Stephen Wagner, Saint Germain is said to be linked to several secret societies from the Rosicrucians to Freemasons, Society of Asiatic Brothers, the Knights of Light, the Illuminati, the Order of Templars. He created an aura of mystery among the nobility by hypnotizing them with tales of past lives and magical powers. According to one source, Saint Germain returned to France during Louis XIV's reign as a confidant of Marie Antoinette. Well, if he was involved with the Jacobins, then he's probably the reason why she lost her head. Who was acquainted with the Count's reputation as a mystic and prophet? When he predicted events with eerie accuracy, including a detailed foretelling of a French Revolution. <laughs> of course he did. Of course he predicted it because it was already plotted out and planned. If he's said to be Francis Bacon, we know that they love to write scripts and enact them in real life. The Queen reportedly responded, only royalty will be left. Saint Germain replied, not even royalty. There will be a bloodthirsty republic whose scepter will be the executioner's knife. However, Saint Germain didn't live to see his prophecy come to fruition. His recorded death is between 1781 and 1784, years before the French Revolution unfolded. However, many believe that was the only, that was the only the first of his many incarnations, including that of Ascended Master. So the most lasting myth surrounding Saint Germain is his status as an Ascended Master with many who claim to have encountered him over hundreds of years. Those report visitations including theosophers such as Annie Besant, C.W. Lee Beta and Edgar Casey. Theosophy founder Madame Blavatsky stated that Saint Germain was one of her masters of wisdom and that she was in possession of several secret documents written by him. In 1881, more than 100 years after St. Germain's reported death, Madame Blavatsky wrote, At long intervals have appeared in Europe certain men whose rare intellectual endowments, brilliant conversation and mysterious modes of life have astounded and dazzled the public mind. The article now copied from all the year round relates to one of these men, the St. 
Count St. Germain. Masters of ancient wisdom or the ascended masters represent a group of souls who allegedly earn their right to ascend and return to earth from time to time as teachers or just teach from a higher plane of existence. According to Atheria Society, an international spiritual organization dedicated to spreading an account and acting upon the teaching of advanced extraterrestrial intelligences, Count St. Germain is one of the ascended masters who include the Lord Babaji, the Lord Maitreya. So this Maitreya is uh, linked to the Metatron. Saint Gu Ling, Swami Vivekananda, and Madame Blavatsky. Among others who reported mystical encounters with Saint Germain include Guy Ballard, founder of the I Am Activity, who claimed he met Saint Germain on Mount Shasta in California in 1930. This legendary encounter resulted in a series of books which Ballard said Saint Germain dictated to him and are known as the Saint Germain series. According to Saint Germain Foundation, an organization dedicated to the teaching and wisdom received by Ballard and headquartered in Schamburg, Illinois. Each book and discourse carries different radiation and consciousness of the ascended masters. In 1957, Elizabeth Clare Prophet, a member of the I Am Activity, also reported a life-altering visitation from Saint Germain and believed him to be among the most prominent of the Ascended Masters. She founded the Summit Lighthouse in 1958 with her husband Mark L. Prophet, as well as the Church Universal Triumphant Centre on Saint Germain. I wonder if she'd been taking the soma milk when she happened to have this vision. Mysterious endings and legacy of the violet flame. There are many who view Count St. Germain as disappearing and reappearing throughout history, masterminding world events. He is looked to as the embodiment of the age of Aquarius and the spiritual figurehead of the New Age movement. Whatever he believes, St. Germain's life ended as mysteriously as it began. While German local records state that he died on February 27, 1784, in Eckenfort as a guest at the castle of Prince Charles of Hesse Castle, Count St. Germain is said to have defied physical death only to live on in reincarnated form, continuing his legend as the immortal Count, or as the playwright Voltaire wrote of the Comte de Saint Germain, he was a man who knows everything and who never dies. So he's obviously the messiah of this occult group who are all behind this. Uh, Protestant Reformation. I, I honestly think a lot of this Protestantism, whether uh, Luther was a Rosicrucian or not, or part of this group, I don't know. But certainly all of these so-called Protestant ministers were. Rosencruz is knighted. The year is 1459. It was on Easter Day 1459 that the Constitutions of the Freemasons of Strasbourg were first signed in Rosenberg, with a second signed shortly after in Strasbourg. The Gutenberg Bible began printing in Mainz, Germany in 1455, and the first Bible in German, the Mental Bible, was printed in Strasbourg in 1466. So I wonder if this was a counter move to the fact that the Bible was being printed, that they needed to infiltrate Western institutions with all this Freemasonic, Kabbalistic group because obviously the uh, the rabbis couldn't infiltrate into Gentile organisations. So the first documented Europeans to visit Tibet were the Portuguese Jesuit missionaries Antonio de Andrade and Manuel Marquet who arrived in 1624, a year later, with the full support of King and Queen of Gouche. Andrade and Marque established a permanent mission at Saparang in the Garuda Valley of Western Tibet's Nagari region. On Andrade's advice, the second Jesuit mission was sent to southern Tibet from India in 1627, reportedly welcomed by the King of Urtsang, the Portuguese missionaries Joao Cabral and Estevio Casella established their mission there in Shigatsi in 1628 and provided the first information about Shambhala to reach the West. 
because both of the Portuguese missions were evacuated in 1635 after becoming embroiled in the power struggle for control of Tibet at the time, it would be another 25 years before the next documented European visit to the country. The first Europeans to meet the Dalai Lama were probably two Jesuit Johannes Gerber of Austria and Albert Dorville, who travelled through Lhasa in 1661 on their way from Beijing to Agra in India. It was from this expedition which the engraving in China Illustrata by the Jesuit and Kabbalist Athanasius Kircher, which is purported to depict 5th Dalai Lama Lobsang Gayatso, 1617 to 1682. The most famous of the early European missionaries to visit Tibet was Hippolyte Desideri, 1684 to 1633, who was the first documented European to have successfully studied and understood Tibet language and culture. In 1388, Swedish mystic Emanuel Swedenborg apparently contacted some Jesuit interests in alchemy when he visited the Royal Academy of Science in Turin, which was housed in the old Jesuit cloister. At the academy was the prize exhibit, the Tabula Isica, which had fascinated Freemasons since time of Sir Robert Moray. In Odephius Aegypticus, 1652, Kirscher used the tablet as a primary source for developing his translation of Egyptian hieroglyphs, which are now known to be incorrect. While reading Kirsch's work, Swedenborg learned of the Jesuit scholar Kabbalistic interpretation of the tablet, which drew heavily on the Sefer Yetzirah and Zohar. Through the influence of Swedenborg, the left-hand Tantra taught a repudiation of conventional morality where Sabbateans could see a similarity to their own doctrine of the holiness of sin, which contributed to the legend of an Oriental Kabbalah into Freemasonry. Swedenborg explained that the lost world, an important symbol in Freemasonry, existed in Asia long before the Israelites. Freemasonry attained its climax in the symbolism of the lost world and a quest for its recovery. The mythical history of Freemasonry claims that there once existed a world of great power which was known only to a few but was eventually lost during the building of Solomon's Temple, according to Swedenborg. Respecting this ancient world, which was in Asia before the Israelitish word, it is still preserved among the peoples who inhibit great Tartary. I have conversed with spirits and angels who were in the spiritual world from that country who said that they possess a word and have possessed it from ancient times. Moreover, they related that they do not suffer foreigners to come among them except the Chinese with whom they cultivate peace, inquire for it in China, and perhaps you may find it among the Tartars. So interesting that this Asian Orientalism has just infiltrated everything and now they're bringing out this Tartarian Belt and Road project. Samuel Jacob Falk, a Kabbalist known as the Baal Shem of London, was a neighbour to Swedenborg on whom he exercised a great influence. Rabbi Jacob Emden accused Falk of being a Sabbatean as he invited Moses David Podhase, a known Sabbatean with connections to Johann Ibis Schutz, to his home. David, who was awed by the abilities as a sorcerer, wrote to Ibis Schutz about Falk, who is still human but already above human. Falk collaborated with the Sabbatean Frankist network in England, Holland, Poland and Germany and who would exercise an important influence in Masonic and occult circles during the 18th century. Some Masons believe that Falk was an old man of the mountain. The traditional name of the leader of the Ismaili assassins or an unknown superior of Illuminist Freemasonry. Falk was linked by some Illuminist Mason to Jacob Frank. Falk was born in Poland to the Sabatine family and came to England in 1742 and set up a shop on the old London Bridge. In Westphalia, Falk was sentenced to be burned as a sorcerer but escaped to England. Falk rapidly gained fame as a Kabbalist and worker of miracles and many stories of his miraculous powers were current, which he was reputed to exercise through his supposed mastery of the magical name of God. Falk kept a diary containing records of dreams and 
the Kabbalistic names of angels, which can be found in the Library of United Synagogue in London. The following is a summary provided in the Jewish Encyclopedia. Folk claims to possess thermoturgic powers and to be able to discover hidden treasure. Arkin holds, recounts certain marvels which he had seen performed by folk in Brunswick and which he attributed to a special knowledge of chemistry. In Westphalia, at one time, folk was sentenced to be burned as a sorcerer but escaped to England. Here he was received with hospitality and rapidly gained fame as a Kabbalist and worker of miracles. Many stories of his powers were current. He would cause a small taper to remain alight for weeks. In incarnation, would fill his cellar with coal. Plate left with a pawnbroker would glide back to his house. When a fire threatened to destroy the great synagogue, he averted the disaster by writing four Hebrew letters on the pillars of the door. This guy sounds like a con artist, and he also reminds me of an Alistair Crowley type of character. Dr. Herman Adler, chief rabbi of the British Empire from 1891 to 1991, observed that the horrible account of a Jewish Kabbalist, the Gentleman's Magazine of September 1762, obviously refers to Dr. Falk. Though his name was not mentioned, this Kabbalist is described as a christened Jew and the biggest rogue and villain in all the world, who had been imprisoned everywhere and banished out of all countries in Germany. The writer goes on to relate that the Kabbalist offered to teach him certain mysteries but explained that before entering on any experiments of the said godly ministries, we must first avoid all churches and places of worshipping as unclean. He then bound the writer to an oath and proceeded to tell him that he must steal a Hebrew Bible from a Protestant and also procure one pound of blood out of the veins of an honest Protestant. The writer therefore robbed a Protestant and had himself bled of a pound of blood which he gave to the sorcerer. He then describes the ceremony that took place when the following night they went into the writer's garden and the Kabbalist put a cross painted with the blood in each corner in the middle and threefold circle. The all in blood in the first circle were written all the names of God in Hebrew, in the second the names of the angels, and the third the first chapter of the Gospel of John. He then described the ritual sacrifice as a he goat. Okay, so Emmanuel Swedenborg was a Swedish plurist, pluralistic Christian theologian and mystic best known for his book on the afterlife, heaven and hell in 1758. A large number of important cultural figures have been influenced by his writings, including Robert Frost, Johnny Appleseed, William Blake, George Louis Borges, Daniel Burnham, Arthur Conan Doyle, Ralph Waldo Emerson, John Flexman, George Innes, Henry and William James, Carl Jung, Immanuel Kant, Honoré de Blazac, Helen Keller, Ceslaw Milos, August Stringberg, D.T. Suzuki, and W.B. Yeats. His philosophy had a great impact on King Carl the Thirteenth of Sweden, nephew of Frederick the Great, who, as the Grand Master of Swedish Freemasonry, built its unique system of degrees and wrote its rituals. Swedenborg had already become immersed in Sabbatean influences, which had made an important penetration in Sweden. At the University of Uppsala, Hebraist and Orientalists were familiar with Sabbatai Zevi's mission through Abraham Texira, Queen Christina's confidant and resident in Hamburg. Texira kept the Christian Hebraist Esdras Ezard, who had been a believer in Sabbatai Zevi, informed before exploiting the disillusionment with the mission of Zevi's apostasy towards converting hundreds of Jews to Christianity. Swedenborg's father, Bishop Jesper Swedberg, spent 10 weeks in the home of Eduard where he learned of his host Sabbatianism. Swedenborg was also exposed to Sabbatianism through the influence of his brother-in-law, the Swedish scholar Eric Benzelius. His chief mentor for 40 years who founded the Royal Society of Science in the Uppsala in 1739, of which Swedenborg became a member. When Benzelius set off on his travels in summer 1697, his primary goal was to visit Zib, 
Leibniz, where he had the opportunity to converse with Francis Mercurius van Helmont. They discussed Kabbalah, Pythagorism, Chinese religion, and various millenarian ideas. They also discussed Truthemius, system of Kabbalistic cryptography and angel magic. Benzelius was so impressed that he acquired rare editions of the Kabbalah, Denuta, Denudata, and Truthemius polygraphy. Benzelius had visited Edzard and studied Kabbalah with Leibniz and Van Helmet and worked closely with Rabbi Johann Kemper, formerly Moses ben Aaron of Krakow, who had been a follower of the Sabbatean prophet Zadok before converting to Christianity. Yeah, sure, he really converted to Christianity. Kemper's esoteric writings on the angel Metatron would influence later Swedish Freemason who developed Kabbalistic rites canted on Metatron, the middle pillar. So this is the star of Freemasonry, the middle pillar, the Jacob's Ladder. Kemper and Benzalius placed great hopes in Charles the Twelfth, the young king of Sweden, who shared the philo-Semitism of his father. For, for Benzilis, these sympathies promoted a new opening of Sweden to new ideas in religion, science and economics. From his study of Johannes Bures' Nordic Kabbalah, he argued that Kabbalistic studies were central to Sweden's national identity. This is kind of interesting because I think that a lot of this Romantic period had a lot to do with establishing Germany's identity in the uh, early 20th century. Benzelius continued, collected Boreas manuscript and inscribed his name on Boreas elaborate illustrations of the Kabbalistic Tree of Life. Kemper was also interested in Boreas system which provided a highly individual path of initiation which leads to unity with God. He and Benzelius learned of John Dee's Monus Hieroglyphia on Boreas, Rosicrucianism. They learned from Leibniz that theories of Gnor von Rosenroth and van Helmet were important to mathematical and scientific advancement. In 1709, Swedenborg admitted his thesis, Selecta Sententia, which revealed the influence of his studies in Strogoticism and Pansophic belief in Great Gothic Sweden. Swedenborg acquired various publications expressing Strogoticist, like those Sigrid Forsius who bolstered Gustavus Adolphus' war effort and Johannes Messinus, the great Strogoticist historian. Swedenborg drew on Loxenius, Rerum Sercarium Historia, which described the role of Boreas's theory runic Gothic Kabbalah in Gustavus Adolphus Nationalist Agenda. Loxenius also discussed George Sternhelm's linguistic theories about Hebraic roots of Swedish, as well as the traditions of incarnations and magic deliriments that fascinated Queen Christina and other Swedish scholars. Loxenius referred further to the Jewish law of Philo Boden. Grotius and Norman, as well as the Neoplatonism of Pythagoras and Macrobius. According to Marsha Keith Shushard, rather than becoming a Newtonian, Swedenborg became a Wilkinsian, for it was John Wilkins, original founder of the Invisible College, who most fired Swedenborg's imagination and ambition. Swedenborg purchased Wilkins' posthumously published mathematical and philosophical works and he wrote Benzelius that his writings are very ingenious. Swedenborg's readings about Kabbalistic, linguistic and mystical techniques would be reinforced by his reading of similar studies by a member of Wilkins' group at Wadham College and founding member of the Royal Society, Robert Hooke. Swedenborg had learned about Dee's symbolic language in London when he made a careful study of Robert Hooke's posthumous works. Hooke had delivered a 
Cartellarian lecture to the Royal Society in which he argued that these descriptions of conversations with angels and spirits were an elaborate diplomatic code. Hook argued that Dee had learned from Trithemius about the value of such a celestial code for dangerous intelligence and diplomatic work. Swedenborg also met John D. Woodward, a fellow of the Royal Society and an active Freemason who collected works by Hermes, Trismegistus, D. Mayer, Van Helmet, Ashmol, and Kirchner. As Shushad remarked that Swedenborg's friend John Woodward owned Cassu Bond's book on D, Ashmole's account of D, Hook's analysis of D's cryptography means that Swedenborg had access to all three while in London. In 1741, Swedenborg entered into spiritual phrase during which he experienced dreams and visions. This culminated in a spiritual awakening through which he claimed he was appointed by the Lord to write a new church doctrine to reform Christianity. According to the new church doctrine, the Lord had opened his spiritual eyes to allow him to visit heaven and hell and talk with angels, demons and other spirits. He said that the last judgment had already occurred in 1757, though it was only visible in the spiritual world where he had witnessed it. That judgment was followed by the second coming of Jesus Christ, which occurred not by Christ in person, but by a revelation from him through the inner spiritual sense of the word. The Moravian Church, Swedenborg was associated with the Fetter Lane Society, was the first flowering of the Moravian Church in England, founded by Count Nicholas Zinzendorf, 1700 to 1760. A German religious and social reformer, Bishop of Moravian Church, and a major figure of the 18th century Protestantism, the Moravian Church formally named the Unitus Fraternum, Latin for Unity of the Brethren, was derived from Hussite movement started by Jan Hus in early 15th century Bohemia, to which had belonged Bishop John Amos Comenis, a core member of the Hart Lib Circle. Hus was burned at the stake at the Council of Constance. In 1415, despite the protection he had received from King Wenceslas the Fourth of Bohemia and his brother Sigismund, Holy Roman Emperor and founder of the Order of the Dragon. Like the Rosicrucians following the Protestant defeat at the Battle of White Mountain in 1620, the Brethren were forced to operate underground and eventually dispersed across northern Europe as far as the Low Countries where communists attempted to direct a resurgence. After 1620, descendants of the Bohemian Brethren who stayed in Bohemia and Moravia, referred to as the Hidden Seed, which communists had prayed would preserve the evangelical faith, made up the core of the regrouping a century later under the influence of Zinzendorf. The refugees established a new village called Herrenhut, Upper Lusitan town in the Gorlitz district of Saxony, Germany. Zinzendorf was raised by a grandmother who corresponded with Leibniz in Latin, read the Bible in Hebrew and Greek, and studied Syrian and Chaldean, and exposed him to themes of Jacob Bohem and Christian Kabbalism. This would bring Zinzendorf into contact with heterodox Jews whose sympathies for the teachings of Sabbatai Zevi led them to positions close to Christian students of Kabbalah, seen by many pious as a medium between the two religions. Zinzendorf was the pupil and godson of the direct originator of pietism, Philip Jacob Spenner. Pietism was a movement within Lutherism that began in the late 17th century, whose forerunners were Jacob Bohm and Johann Valentin Andre, the author of the Rosicrucian Manifestos. Spenner was powerfully influenced by the preaching of the converted Jesuit preacher Jean de Labadie. Originally a Jesuit priest, Labadie became a member of the Reformed Church in 1650 before founding the community which became known as the 1669. Labadie was among those who had been kept informed on the progress of Zabatai Zevi's mission by Peter. Sererius and spoke about the Sabbateans in his sermons. 
Labadee's movement attracted some notable female converts such as the famed poet and scholar Anna Maria van Sherman and entomological artist Maria Merriant. Among Sherman's friends were Dutch composer Constantine Huygens, who was in touch with René Descartes, Rembrandt, John Doan and the painter Jan Levens. Through correspondence in Latin, Hebrew and French, Sherman established a network of learned women across Europe, including John Dury's wife, Dorothea Moore, Bathsheba Macon, and feminist Marie de Gournay, Marie du Moulin, Elizabeth of Bohemia, and Queen Christina of Sweden. Macon, who was influenced by the writings of Comenius, was known as the most learned woman in England and was tutor to the children of Charles I of England and governess to his daughter Elizabeth Stuart. In 1670, Labadee Sherman and his congregation moved into a house in Hereford, Germany, provided as a refuge by Elizabeth of Bohemia. According to Masonic author Arthur E. Waite, Zinzendorf organised his followers into a hierarchical sex society that functioned as an offshoot of irregular or Illuminati Freemasonry. In 1722, Zinzendorf created a secret society called the Order of the Grain of a Mustard Seed, connected to Freemasonry and Rosicrucianism. The order was revived in 1739 when Zinzendorf managed to recruit to the Archbishop of Canterbury and Paris, as well as Christian VI, King of Denmark. It was also one of the first inventory orders introduced into early German Freemasonry, meaning orders which added new material, often Christian or Templar, to the traditional three-degree system. In 1803, C.G. von Moer wrote that the Order of the Mustard Seed was a pale imitation of the Society of the Rosicrucians and a form of spiritual Freemasonry. Critics charged that Zinzendorf bestows orders of knighthood while his initiates wore a Templar-style cross. The first article of the order affirmed that the members of our society will love the whole human family and as crusaders for Christ seek conciliation with the Jews. Well, this is their main priority, isn't it? In 1722, Zinzendorf had offered asylum to a number of persecuted wanderers from Morovia and Bohemia and permitted them to build a village in Hernhut on a corner of his estate in Berthelsdorf. As Hernhut grew, it became known as a place of religious freedom and attracted individuals from a variety of persecuted groups, including the Schwenkfelders founded by Caspar Schwenkfeld, who had flourished in Gorlitz in Jacob Bohem's time and who were later closely related to the coal giants. Although Schwenkfeld did not organize a separate church during his lifetime. In 1700, there were about 1,500 of his followers in Lower Silesia, who became known as Schwankfelders. Many fled Silesia under persecution of the Austrian emperor, and some found refuge in Sindendorf's lands on his Hernhutter Brudergement. A group arrived in Philadelphia in 1731, followed by five more migrations up to 1737. The Fetter Lane Society. In 1738, Peter Bowler, the London Moravian leader, and his followers established the Fetter Lane Society in London, the first flowering of the Moravian Church in England. Following their practice in Germany, they had a custom of fellowshipping at a common meal or a love fest prior to taking communion. Most of their members were Anglicans, most prominently John Wesley, his brother Charles Wesley, and George Whitfield. Charles Wesley recorded in his journal for January 1st, 1739, Mr. Hall Hinching Ingham, Whitfield Hutching, and my brother Charles were present at our love fest in Fetter Lane with about 60 of our brethren. About three in the morning as we were continuing instant in prayer and power of God came mighty upon us in so much that many cried out for exceeding joy and many fell to the ground. As soon as we were recovered a little from that awe, the amazement at the presence of his majesty, we broke out with a one voice. We praise thee, O God. We acknowledge thee to be the Lord. 
Swedenborg was a visitor from 1744 to 45 and again 48 to 49. The Fetter Lane Society in London, the biography Peter Ackroyd observed that the obscurity surrounding the origin of the name Fetter Lane suggests that the city was trying to conceal its origins. The more simple connection has been made with the workshop of the street which manufactured fetters for lace vests for the Knights Templar who also congregated in the vicinity. Throughout its history, Fetter Lane acted as a boundary or has been recorded as frontier territory. It has attracted those who live upon the edge. In 1749, Zinzendorf leased Lindsay House, a large manor on Cheyenne Walk in Chelsea, built on the estate of Sir Thomas More to be a headquarters for work in England. Zinzendorf lived there until 1755 when the Moravians in London became so married in controversy that Zinzendorf was forced to leave the country in a sensational expose that received wide public attention in London. Henry Remius, a Prussian who visited the Moravians in London, described them as a subversive secret society whose leaders are gradually sapping the foundation of civil government in any country they settle in and establishing an empire within an empire. According to Glenn Diner, it was possibly at this time that the Moravians and Rabbi Ibershutz, then denounced as a crypto sabbatean in the Emden Ibershutz controversy, discovered their mutual interests. Zinzendorf was so fascinated by Jacob and Frank's mission that after thousands of Frankists converted to Catholicism in Poland, he set missionaries among the Jewish followers who converted to Moravianism to meet with Frank's disciples. Zinzendorf then adopted the anatomianism of the Frankists by elaborating Kabbalistic sex rites into bizarre Christian teachings. According to the Kabbalistic theories of Zinzendorf, God and the universe are comprised sexual potencies, the Sephiroth of the Kabbalah, which interact with each other and produce orgasmic joy when in perfect equilibrium, recalling the union of the cherubim in the Holy of Holies. Kabbalists claim that the cherubim were embraced in the act of intercourse, symbolizing God's union with the Shekinah. After the destruction of the temple, the union of the cherubim depends on ritual intercourse between Kabbalists and his wife. According to James Hutton, an English Moravian who became a lifelong friend of Richard Cosway, the public society held open meetings in the Feta Lane Chapel. While the elite interior order met secretly, lived communally and practiced Kabbalistic rituals, Zinzendorf began the practice of adjusting marriages by switching partners and often held mass adjustments during which a large number of young boys and girls were brought together in sexual unions within the meeting house. In public sermons, the Count claimed that the person regenerated enjoys a great liberty because Christ can make the most villainous act to be a virtue and the most exalted moral virtue to be a vice. Because the genital organs of either sex are most honourable and of, of the whole body, he commanded, the wives, when they see the male member, to honour that precious sign by which they resemble Christ. The female vulva is that little model of the chapel of God to which husbands are to offer worship. Kind of sounds like a charismatic church to me. And if anyone knows what goes on in, a lot of the, in the background of a lot of those big charismatic churches, it's nothing but a uh, swapping of partners. Like the Frankists before him, Zinzendorf created a theology of sacred wounds of Christ. The Frankists were at the forefront of the revival of the Catholic mystical and devotional practice centered on Our Lady and the Eucharist Lord, such as the Rosary Novenus, devotion to the sacred and immaculate hearts, benedictions, the 40 hours devotions and perpetual Eucharist adoration. Devotion to the sacred heart developed out of the devotion to the holy wounds, in particular to the sacred wound in the sight of Jesus. The five holy wounds or the five sacred wounds are the five piercing wounds Jesus suffered during the crucifixion. These practices grew from influences of St. Bernard of Clairvaux, patrons of the Templars and St. Francis of Assisi, who according to Stephen Runciman was influenced by the Cathars. Devotion to the sacred heart of Jesus marked a spiritually 
spirituality of Saint Bernard of Clairvaux in the 12th century of Saint Bonaventure and Saint Gertrude the Great in the 13th. The, this devotion was strongly opposed in and out of the church and suppressed in many places. During the so-called shooting zid or shifting period, a series of experiments in egalitarianism, magical and sexual practices, Zinzendorf led the Moravians into interpreting every aspect of passion and death of Christ in increasingly erotic terms. Zinzendorf interpreted the wounds in Christ's side caused by the soldiers Longinus in overtly sexual terms. The wound became a vaginal orifice. Gross. The sight Hawken or the little side cave. Zinzendorf enjoined his followers to meditate upon the cave and to enter it in a phallic sense and to take pleasure therein. The wound became for Zinzendorf the birth canal of the Christian church. According to Zinzendorf, meditation of Christ's sexual organs as well as his wounds would lead to a mystical experience as he explained. All the senses must be mobilized. The whole body must participate. According to Zinzendorf, meditation on Christ's sexual organs as well as his wounds would lead to a mystical experience as he explained. All the sense must be mobilized. The whole body must participate. See how crazy these people are. Like Zinzendorf, Swedenborg considered the Sabbatean version of Kabbalah could end the ancient division between Judaism and Christianity. Though Swedenborg broke with the Moravians, he continued to infuse Kabbalistic concepts into his Christian theosophy, such as Zinzendorf's bizarre Kabbalistic sex rites in 1741. Swedenborg had entered into a spiritual phase during which he experienced dreams and visions. This culminated in spiritual awakening through which he claimed he was appointed by the Lord to write a new church doctrine to reform Christianity. According to the new church doctrine, the Lord had opened his spiritual eyes to allow him to visit heaven and hell and talk with angels, demons and other spirits. He said that the last judgment had already occurred, 1757. In Why Mrs. Blake Cried, William Blake and the Sexual Bias of Spiritual Vision, Marsha Keith Shrushad proposes that Swedenborg could have learned about tantric yoga from members of crypto sabbatean Moravian Church who had sent missionaries in 1740 to India, China, Tibet, Tartary and Central Russia and from Moravian converts among the Kokin Jews who travelled to London and Holland. Swedenborg was a follower of the crypto sabbatean Count Nicholas Ludwig Zinzendorf, who was familiar with Marco Polo's 13th century account branded the yogis of Malabar as alchemists and with Francois Bernier's popular travels in the Mongol Empire, 1670, which presented yogic and Sufic mysticism as a form of Kabbalism. Brenner further claimed that the yogic philosophy was the same as the Robert Flood and thus part of Rosicrucian tradition. The anti-Rosicrucian writer Henrik Newhorse in his Pia et Utilissimia 1618 claimed that the Rosicrucians had departed for India according to alchemist Michael Mayer. The Rosicrucians were preceded by a college of gymnosophists among the Ethiopians, college of Magi among Persians and college of Brahmins in India. In the preference to his 1652 translation of the Rosicrucian Manifesto, Thomas Vaughan offers a parallel between the Rosicrucians and the Indian Brotherhood visited by Apollonius of Tiana. This perceived link was reinforced by Samuel Richer, a Protestant pastor from Silesia who reported in 1710 that the Rosicrucians have left Europe and gone to India. Published in Breslau in 1710, which sparked off a renewal of interest in Rosicrucianism in the 18th century, here the Rosy Cross now became the Golden and Rosy Cross, demonstrating a new alchemical emphasis. Swedenborg located the source of his Kabbalistic theories not among the Jews but in Asia. Influenced by the Sabbateans and their sexual doctrines, Swedenborg became intrigued by the similarity of yogic tantra techniques in meditation to the Kabbalistic ones. He was fascinated with the Shambhala myth and journey to India and Central Asia, bringing back with him the sexual rites that were incorporated in his New Jerusalem society. 
Adepts of Chinese and Tibetan Tantra claim that heightened experience culminating in the ability to communicate with spirits perform automatic writing, clairvoyance and astral travel similarly as explained Shushat. While associating with Moravian and Jewish mystics in London, the 56-year-old Swedenborg learned how to perform the mystical Kabbalistic marriage within his mind through a sublime of sexual energy into visionary energy by meditating on the male and female potencies concealed in the vessels of Hebrew letters, by visualizing these letters in the forms of human bodies, by regulating the inhalation and exhalation of breath. The reverent Kabbalistic could achieve an orgasmic trance state that elevated him to the world of spirits and angels. This is this tantric sex. During Swedenborg's early participation with the Moravian Brethren, one of Zinzendorf's missionaries to the Jews also recruited East Indians from Malabar who came to London. In London, Swedenborg and his Moravian associates studied Kabbalistic forms of meditation, visualization, breath control and sexual yoga that were similar to tantric practices. At the same time, Shushard explained Swedenborg maintained a love-hate relationship with the Jews from whom he continued to learn Kabbalistic techniques and meditation and Bible interpretation. However, the prevailing anti-Semitism in Sweden led Swedenborg to gradually displace his theories of the source of the Kabbalah from Israel to Asia. Well, this is interesting because this could tie in with this Aryan Jesus and all the information of Blavatsky coming out of Asia and the Jesuits who were in Asia at this time as well. The Nazi fascination with Tibet and the occult. This all ties in with the German Romantic period and this paganism that they were trying to force Germans to have this Gnostic pagan identity. Taking advantage of the great interest in Asian culture generated by Swedish East India Company, which secretly employed him, Swedenborg argued that the yogis of Great Tartary discovered the secrets of Kabbalism long before the Jews in The Secret of the Great Tartary. Andreas Hallengren argues that Swedenborg's Great Tartary was among the Turkic Mongolian people of Mongolia between Tibet and Siberia and that he had access to rare Asiatic manuscripts and oral traditions brought back by relatives and colleagues. So basically during this time we have this big agenda to push this Aryan, pagan, oriental religion to the European people. Why? Why do they have this agenda? At the same time we've got Swedenborg here saying that the Kabbalah was originally founded in these Asian Tartarian regions which we know as far west is Khazaria. We know that these Ashkenazi People come from Khazaria, they're the Khazars. They call themselves Ashkenazi. I don't know why they do that. I know Ashkenaz was a grandson of Japheth. Were they from the tribes of Ashkenaz? I don't know why they call themselves Ashkenaz. I've heard that there's a town in Germany that they say they came from, it's called Ashkenaz. And I know that Ashkenaz was allied with Meshek and Tubal who were from Anatolia or the Turkish region before the Mongols invaded. So in Ezekiel, I believe it says, Gog and Magog, chief prince of Meshek and Tubal. So Ashkenaz was not of this group, but he was an ally to these tribes. I am not convinced that the Germanic people are Scythian. I think there's a lie there somewhere and... I am convinced of the Sumerian argument. I think that the Sumerians appeared in the region of Georgia, the southern Black Sea region, out of nowhere and were pushed by the Scythians into Anatolia and are recorded as raiding several peoples there and then disappeared. The Sumerians are linked to the Thracians and the Thracians are linked to the Germanic peoples. So I do believe the Sumerians or Gimeri, the name is linked to a king who was one of the kings of the northern tribes. I think that they were definitely lost tribes, but I'm not convinced of the Scythians yet. Not saying that I'm right, but I'm a little confused because 
we have these Khazars. We know the Khazars converted to the religion of the Babylonian Talmud and the Kabbalah via the Silk Road Babylonian Chaldean Nabataean traders. It's my opinion that these people are Gog Magog, so therefore they can't be lost tribes of Israel. But if I'm wrong, then they are lost tribes of Israel too, if the Khazars are actually Scythian and if the Scythian are actually lost tribes of Israel. So we'll have to see about that. I want to look into that more. From information I found, the Scythians were on the Asian steep, Central Asia and up in the Altai Mountains up near Siberia very early on. So I can't understand how the Scythians would have just shown up in around 700 BC and been lost tribes of Israel. This doesn't make sense to me. I actually think they're tribes of Japheth and I think they are these particular tribes of Japheth that in the end will attack with the dragon. Now, I've identified the dragon as being Esau, as being, according to Malachi 1, the dragons of the wilderness who inherited Esau's legacy. So Esau mixed with the Nabataeans, the Nabataeans being Chaldeans. So these Chaldeans are dragons. We're looking at this Babylonian priesthood, these false people that call themselves Israelites. So we've got the dragon attacking the saints in the end, bringing Gog, Magog with them. And I've said this before, I don't just think that Gog, Magog is these Ashkenazi people because if the Ashkenazi or Khazarian people are Japheth tribes, the tribe that was described, Gog, Magog, chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, then it was the Mongolians from this Asian steppe that invaded Anatolia and Basically, since the Ottoman Empire, the Turkish people haven't been the same people because they were invaded by Mongols. The people of Central Asia and the uh, Asian steppe are Turkic people. So all of these people are related. So I, I actually think that nothing against anybody who's from this background, but I think that it's communism that is Gog Magog and communism has thrived in these regions of the world. We've got China that's communist. We've got uh, Russia. The We know who brought communism to these countries and, you know, we've got Vietnam, we've got uh, Cambodia. When I was in Nepal, the Nepalese were being taken over by Maoist communists. Communism thrives in these regions of the world. This is pretty much what's happened to our culture. We've had these aristocratic bankers that go mu back much further than the Khazarian converts and together they have systematically attacked the saints. They've attacked Western culture. I'm thinking that the lie is either that the German people are descendants of Scythians and the Scythians are actual lost tribes of Israel that these particular Jews who say that they're Germanic, Yiddish is actually a Slavic language. They've found that recently out in the last few years that it doesn't have Germanic roots, it has Slavic roots. So whether they're associating, associating themselves, these Khazar tribes are associating themselves as Ashkenaz and they're not and that's the lie, or whether they're lying that G the Germanic people were Scythians and perhaps the Scythians were actually lost tribes of Israel, as a lot of people say. But somewhere in this story, there's a lie, and I have to uh, look into it more. But for some reason, they're trying to convince the European people, the Germanic people, that they have these Aryan Oriental roots. When, if there is any truth in what Swedenborg is saying, it's that the Kabbalistic roots are of Oriental origin. Now, when we look at the Orient, we think of China and these kind of places, but even Persia was considered Western Oriental Asia, all of the Arabic countries and Turkey as well. Babylon is on the border of these 
oriental philosophies. We have a group of people moving out into the Asian steep and into Central Asia, taking these Gnostic religions with them, the Kabbalah. So yeah, there's a bit of truth that the Kabbalah is Babylonian. It's not Abrahamic. Abraham moved out of Babylon. He was told to remove himself. He became nomadic. God told him, the father told him that he was to be a set apart people. What does that mean? To come out of Babylon, to set himself aside out of this system and to have nothing to do with it. He was chosen by God to do that, a chosen people to not mix themselves with these corrupt religions. The true Israelites and the true Abrahamic faith was not Kabbalistic. So there's truth in what Swedenborg is saying here. In his spiritual diary, Swedenborg drew on the travel journal of Philip Strahlenberg, a Swedish officer and former prisoner, to describe the spiritual relation between the Tibetans, Tatars, Chinese and Siberians. Swedenborg shared an interest in Strahlenberg with James Parson, a fellow of the Royal Society, who was well versed in Hermeticism, the Talmud and the Zohar. So it's so interesting that all this Tartarian information coming out saying that they're the creators of society today or the builders of Western culture, Western architecture, and trying to indoctrinate Western people to think that everything about their culture, everything about their history and ancestors was oriental. It's just a, a rehash of this romantic period in Nazism. Like Swedenborg's Parsons studied Drollsberg report, the earliest Swedish theories of Gothic history, which led him to propose similarities between Kabbalistic, Tibetan, Nordic, Gaelic and Christian beliefs in a triune godhead. Parson published his findings in the remains of Jaffet, 1767. Swedenborg also acquired a rare book that explicitly linked the yogic and Kabbalistic mystical traditions de la Crequines Conformite de la Cotumes de Indians Oriento avec Celes de Juifs, which was translated into English by radical pantheist John. Toland and provoked much interest among Masonic students of the esoteric sciences. La Criquinaires claimed an Asian origin for the paraphic rites of the Jews, which were represented by erotic sculptures of male and female fertility figures. The priapic rites purportedly remained in India until the time of Solomon. In the 65th years of Jesus Christ, they were carried into China. So these are the uh, references to these quotes. This is from a website called orderabko.ca. So this video is getting very long now and I'm going to continue on in another episode. Thanks for listening, everyone.